Hi there, I'm Dr. Ginger Campbell, host of Brain Science, Grain Rainbows, and Books and Ideas. For the last few months, I've been planning to relaunch my Books and Ideas podcast in December with my special guest, Podcasting Hall of Famer, Dr. Pamela Gay. Unfortunately, there was a technical glitch during our first effort to record, and since then, Dr. Gay has been ill, which means I will miss my goal to release episode 62 on December 15th, 2018. I'm not sure when the episode will actually appear, but I want you to know that I plan to release Books and Ideas on a monthly basis in 2019. If you've let your subscription lapse, I hope you will resubscribe because I have a diverse mix of interesting guests planned. Books and Ideas also has a free mobile app that you can set to notify you when a new episode is released. I look forward to talking with you very soon. Welcome to Brain Science, the podcast that explores how neuroscience is helping unravel the mystery of how our brain makes us human. I'm your host, Dr. Ginger Campbell, and this is episode 152. This is our 12th annual review episode, but before I get started, I need to mention a couple of things. First, for the last six months, I've been trying to recruit about 12 listeners to join me on a trip to Australia in May 2019. Unfortunately, the response has not been what I had hoped, and I have decided to cancel this trip. I want to apologize to all the Australian listeners who have been looking forward to our meetups in Melbourne and Sydney, and I hope I can reschedule the trip in the future. Now, I want to get on with the review, but if you are a premium or Patreon supporter, thank you so much for your support. And I need to encourage you to listen carefully for an important announcement later in the episode. Also, don't forget you can get complete show notes and episode transcripts at our website at brainsciencepodcast.com. Brain Science was launched as the Brain Science Podcast on December 5th, 2006. So I've been doing review episodes since 2007. I like taking time to reflect back on the year, not just to review the key ideas, but also to consider how they relate to each other and past topics. So as a brief look back at 2018, this is the 12th episode of the year, which means I succeeded with my goal of putting out an episode every month. There were 10 original episodes and one encore interview. Returning guests included Michael Graziano, Elkanon Goldberg, Marianne Wolf, and Seth Grant. There were four new guests Rodrigo Kion Quiroga, Alan Jasenhoff, Angela Frederici, and Dean Burnett. We discussed a wide diversity of topics from memory, peripersonal cells, creativity, language, reading, the cerebral mystique, the synapse, happiness, emotion, and the career of Eve Martyr. When I started this show back in 2006, my goal was to share some of the wonderful books I was reading and to provide a place for people to get an accurate account of neuroscience. Why neuroscience? Because even when the connection is indirect, neuroscience is helping unravel the mystery of how our brains make us human. But there's one other thing that I don't usually mention explicitly. Not only does mainstream media provide very poor coverage of science, it also distorts how science is really done. Unfortunately, the way science is taught in school leaves most people with the impression that science is just a bunch of boring facts. I love interviewing scientists on this show so that you can get a sense of how science is really done, including the fact that it's done by people that aren't that different from you. They are driven by passion and curiosity, and the reason I'm still doing this show after all these years is because science is a process. We don't have all the answers, but we have lots of interesting questions. We had several guests this year that challenged some well-entrenched ideas, and I'm going to try to highlight those examples as we look back on the year's episode. Let's start with episode 141 which was the interview with Dr. Rodrigo Kion Quiroga, author of The Forgetting Machine, 
Memory, Perception, and the Jennifer Aniston Neuron. The title of his book captures all the key ideas, both from the book and from the interview. Both memory and perception behave in ways that aren't intuitively obvious, but they share important principles. Our brain creates our perception of the world. Vision provides the best studied example. Much of the visual information that hits our retinas never reaches our consciousness, but our brain creates a continuous experience that hides things like the blind spot that exists in each eye. Much detail is discarded to create a meaningful image. Similarly, we don't remember most of what happens because our brain's priority is the creation of meaning. If that sounds odd to you, I encourage you to go back and listen to this episode. With regards to the Jennifer Aniston neuron, several points have stayed with me all year. One was the fact that Kiroga's career actually suffered because of the way his discovery was misrepresented in the mainstream press. But more important is to understand why discovery is so interesting. Kiroga found neurons in the hippocampus that responded to specific people and objects, such as Jennifer Aniston and characters from Star Wars. This was surprising because it was generally assumed that the role of the hippocampus is the temporary storage of memories before they're stored in long-term memory. However, Kiroga actually calls these neurons concept neurons because he feels that they may be involved in memory recall. It will be interesting to see where this discovery leads. I recommend The Forgetting Machine to readers of all backgrounds, and especially to young readers who might just be getting interested in science. I think it's a great gift. In episode 142, I talked with Dr. Michael Graziano about his new book, The Spaces Between Us, A Story of Neuroscience, Evolution, and Human Nature. This was Dr. Graziano's second appearance on Brain Science, but I have to tell you that this book was very different from the last book I featured. It was a very personal account of the discovery of peripersonal neurons. Those are the neurons that keep track of the spaces near our body, and they make it possible for us to do many things that we take for granted, such as using tools and moving through the world without bumping into one another. I think this book deserves a much larger audience It should be read by anyone who's interested in a career in neuroscience because it provides the inside story of an important discovery, including a candid description of the mistakes along the way. Also, he provides a glimpse into a creative approach that is fast disappearing in the current funding climate. I actually have an extra copy of The Spaces Between Us, which I'll be happy to send to the first person who sends me an email at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. In episode 143, I talked with Dr. Elkanon Goldberg. He was one of my earliest guests way back in episode 17, which aired in 2007. I actually featured both of his earlier books before interviewing him, so I was glad to have a chance to talk with him about his latest book, Creativity, the Human Brain in the Age of Innovation. Naturally, we revisited some of his key ideas regarding the prefrontal lobes and the right hemisphere. Dr. Goldberg is a neuropsychologist, and he has a unique take on the right hemisphere that I find quite compelling. He sees it as the hemisphere dedicated to novelty. If this is a new idea to you, I recommend listening to this episode and reading his book, since it contains extensive references. When we first talked years ago, Dr. Goldberg emphasized the importance of continuing to learn new skills as we get older, but in his new book, he made a surprising observation. The incidence of dementia is actually dropping. He speculated that this may be related to the fact that recent technological changes are forcing more people to learn new skills, such as mastering iPads and using Google. Sure, there's still plenty of people saying, I'm too old to learn, fill in the blank. But their peers are showing that not only is this not true, but being willing to learn how to use these new technologies may contribute to our brain's health as we age. I'm going to take a break here to talk a little bit about how you can support the show. Over this past year, I've been reminding listeners that the modest income I make from brain science is an important part of my budget. 
This show is time-consuming to produce, and though I am passionate about the content, I don't consider this a hobby. There are several ways to support the show, and you will find links to every option at brainsciencepodcast.com forward slash donations. The main ways people support the show financially are via premium subscriptions and or Patreon. These are both options that allow you to support the show on a monthly basis, while PayPal is available for single donations. For the sake of newer listeners, I want to review the difference between premium and Patreon. Premium is a monthly subscription available through my podcasting host, Lipson. Premium subscribers have access to the entire backlog of brain science, which includes over 100 audio episodes as well as transcripts. You also get audio from any Facebook Live sessions and transcripts for new episodes. In 2018, premium subscribers also had access to ad-free episodes. The best way to access premium content is via the free Brain Science mobile app, though you can also access it on your desktop by logging into the My Lipson account that is created when you sign up. Because it gives you access to so much content beyond the most 50 recent episodes, premium is a great choice for new listeners. Patreon is a better choice for longtime listeners who don't really need access to the back catalog. It allows you to control how much you contribute each month. In 2018, Patreon supporters also got new transcripts, Facebook Live audio, and ad-free episodes. Unfortunately, the only way to access this extra content is downloading it directly from Patreon. The good news is that most smartphones now allow you to listen to audio files on websites and from places like Dropbox, so you don't have to deal with trying to import premium content into iTunes. In the past, I have told people that I don't care whether you go with Premium or Patreon, but moving forward, I'd like to encourage longtime listeners to move toward Patreon. In January, I will be instituting the following changes. The monthly premium subscription is going to go up from $4.99 a month to $8.49 a month. This is because the amount of premium content has almost doubled since the original rate was established in January of 2014. The rate for six months will be $48, and the rate for one year will be $92. That means you'll save nearly $3 if you sign up for six months, and over $9 if you sign up for a year. These changes are scheduled to take effect on January 15th. However, I have good news for current subscribers. According to Lipson, as long as you keep your subscription active, you will be grandfathered into the lower rates. Since Patreon allows supporters to choose what they will pay, they encourage a tier system, which I've never used, but which I'm going to start using in January. The new tiers will be as follows. If you donate 3 to $5 a month, you will get transcripts only. For 6 to $9, you'll get transcripts plus bonus content such as the Brain Science Live audio. For $10 or more a month, you'll get transcripts, bonus content, and ad-free episodes. Beginning in January, only Patreon supporters that give $10 or more a month will get ad-free content. The 50 most recent episodes of Brain Science will continue to be free. That means that even if you can't support the show financially, you can help by sharing the show with others. Moving on to episode 144, this was an interview with Dr. Angela Friederici, who wrote the book, Language in Our Brain, The Origins of a Uniquely Human Capacity. This was the most technical book I covered in 2018, but it can be read by anyone who is motivated to understand how the brain does language. Dr. Friderici is a leader in this field, and her book is a comprehensive review. During the interview, I think she did a good job of making the ideas accessible without visual aids. It turns out that we know a lot about how language is processed in the brain, but I have to admit that I was surprised to learn how much linguistics is contributing to that understanding. For one thing, dividing language into three main parts, syntax, semantics, and phonology, is supported by the neuroscience. In fact, syntax and phonology are processed very early, essentially automatically. 
With regards to different languages, all languages use the same major brain regions, but there are differences in the strengths of the fiber pathways connecting the various parts. For example, languages like Chinese that depend on prosody have stronger connections between the right and left hemisphere because the right hemisphere is essential for processing prosody. It was fascinating to learn how experiments are designed to overcome the lack of temporal resolution in fMRI studies. Often, test subjects actually read sentences, and one of the interesting findings that Dr. Federici shared was the fact that when we read a comma, our brain generates a pause, which means that it's duplicating the prosody of spoken language. This made me think of the importance of phonology in learning to read, which differs from language in that reading doesn't occur automatically. People exposed to language early in life automatically learn language without explicit instruction. And while language has been around for many thousands of years, written language and reading are relatively new cultural inventions, maybe 5,000 years at the most. There are many human languages that lack a written form. Which leads us in to episode 145 with Marianne Wolf, who is the, one of my other very early guests. I think it was episode 29 in which we talked about her book, Proust and the Squid, The Story and Science of the Reading Brain. The timing of this year's interview was a little unfortunate because it occurred a few months before the release of Dr. Wolf's latest book, Reader Come Home, The Reading Brain in a Digital World. I had originally planned this interview to be a follow-up of episode 136, in which I discussed language at the speed of sight by Dr. Mark Seidenberg. Seidenberg's book is an interview of the current knowledge in science of reading. I mention this because I got feedback from listeners that thought Dr. Wolf was unfairly dismissive of certain entrenched methods of teaching reading. If you care about how children learn how to read and what the science really shows, I recommend episode 136 and Seidenberg's book. Other listeners were upset about what they perceived as an attack on digital media. I reread the transcript of our conversation and I thought Dr. Wolf was clear that her concern is that because we are not hardwired to read, how we learn to read affects our brains. Learning to read changes the brain, and so does the way we read. There is evidence that reading on digital devices is more superficial. This actually makes sense if you think about how our brain forms memories. The more senses that are involved, the easier it is to remember. This includes the tactile sensations of holding a book or magazine and our visual memory of where things were on the page. These are elements that don't exist when we read digitally. Even if you ignore all the other distractions, including the constant temptation to click on links. Perhaps Dr. Wolf's fears that what she calls the deep reading brain will disappear will prove unfounded. But based on what we know about brain plasticity, I agree with her argument that we should pay attention and use the signs of reading to help make sure future generations don't lose something valuable along the way. In case you haven't heard any of Dr. Wolf's previous interviews, I will remind you that she has spent decades studying how children learn how to read and helping those with challenges like dyslexia. She continues to emphasize the importance of reading to your children aloud, starting in infancy, and I think that bit of advice deserves repeating. That's the best way to pass on your love of reading, not handing them an iPad. I'm always trying to find ways to challenge what I think I know and learn as much as I can. One of my favorite ways to do that is with the Great Courses Plus. I love being able to learn about many fascinating topics from experts in their fields. There's unlimited access to stream thousands of lectures in topics from anatomy, history, learning a new language, gardening, just about anything you can think of, and they're always adding new courses and new lectures. And you can watch from any device or even listen along with the Great Courses Plus mobile app. This month, I'm recommending Being Human, Life Lessons from the Frontiers of Science. 
This course is taught by Robert Sobolski, who is one of my most requested guests, though he has not yet been on brain science. Consider this course the next best thing. Dr. Sobolski studies how stress affects the brain, but he also studies animal behavior, which has led to some surprising discoveries about how we are both similar and different from our primate cousins. I want you to start benefiting from the Great Courses Plus 2, and right now you can get unlimited access to their entire library of lectures for free. But to start your free trial, you must sign up using my special URL. Go to thegreatcoursesplus.com forward slash ginger. Remember, it's thegreatcoursesplus.com forward slash ginger. Next, we come to episode 146 with Dr. Alan Jasenhoff of MIT and his book, The Biological Mind, How Brain, Body, and Environment Collaborate to Make Us Who We Are. The idea of his book and the interview is that we are more than our brain and why this matters. We talked about several factors that contribute to the tendency to see the brain as being significantly different from other organs of our body. One of the most obvious is emphasizing its electrical properties and comparing the brain to a computer while ignoring its overwhelmingly chemical nature. Another factor is the habit of emphasizing how complex the brain is, which tends to set it up on some sort of mysterious pedestal. Possibly, worst of all, is seeing the brain as autonomous when in fact, as an organ of the body, it is totally dependent on the body and the world around us. My favorite analogy is to compare the brain to the engine of a car, although I guess these days you could compare it to a car's computer system. However, the point is that the engine's essential, but it's not the car. Neither the engine or the computer system alone can get you to work or wherever else you want to go. Because brain science emphasizes the value of neuroscience in helping us understand how our brains make us human, I think it's equally important to remind listeners that neuroscience is not the only way to understand what it means to be human. Some truths about the human condition are better communicated via tools like fiction and poetry. The final point I want to make, again, is that the tendency to see any problem, even mental illness, only in terms of the brain, not only ignores the role of the body and the environment, including the people around us, but it narrows our imagination, preventing us from seeing solutions that lie outside the brain. I hope you're enjoying this 12th annual review episode, but I want to take a moment to ask you for your feedback about 2019. I intend to create new monthly episodes, but I'm not sure whether I want to continue Brain Science Live, which I've been recording on Facebook on the first Thursday of every month. Also, thinking about turning the transcripts from 2018 into a short book. Of course, I would rewrite it, but I've decided that before I do this, put the work in, I will ask listeners to support the project. The price will be $11.99 for the ebook, and a print version will also be available. Would you buy this book? Write to me at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com to answer these questions. One, Should I continue Brain Science Live in 2019? And two, would you buy a short book based on this year's episodes? Back to our review. In episode 147, I reviewed or summarized the book Lessons from the Lobster, Eve Martyr's Work in Neuroscience by Charlotte Nassim. In this episode, I gave a fairly brief overview of Lessons from the Lobster which is actually a scientific biography that focuses on Eve Martyr's 40-year-plus career in neuroscience. I considered several of her major discoveries and expressed my opinion that she deserves a Nobel Prize for the invention of the so-called dynamic clamp method. However, for the purpose of today's review, I want to emphasize the implications of several of her discoveries that share an important theme. Martyr and her team have shown that even invertebrates like the lobster demonstrate more variability than has long been assumed. Even when the wiring diagram appears to be the same in every animal, the individual neurons can achieve the same output even with a three to five fold variability in key parameters. 
This is a reminder that living creatures are different from human-made structures like computers. This variability is what allows them to be both robust and adaptable. But it has important implications for doing science because it means you can't easily extrapolate results between species or even between animals of the same species. It means that data that might seem anomalous might actually be valid. Naturally, this is news that many scientists would rather ignore. But confirmation is coming from many sources. For example, last year when we talked with Seth Grant, he described his lab's discovery that gene expression in the mouse brain seems to follow a set calendar, which means that different genes are turned on depending on the age of the animal. Unfortunately, this also means that animal age becomes a variable that has to be considered when comparing results between experiments. Fortunately, this discovery of diversity and multiple realizability is coming at a time when computational biologists are developing tools for dealing with the large amount of data that is being created. Episode 148 is a replay of the interview I recorded with Dr. Martyr back in 2009. It's an excellent complement to episode 148. Dr. Martyr provides some autobiographical information that doesn't appear in Nassim's book, especially with regards to her experience as a woman graduate student at a time when biology was dominated by men. When I got to episode 149, I was really looking to have a less technical episode, so I picked Dr. Dean Burnett, the author of two popular books, The Idiot Brain and Happy Brain. I was hoping that since he is also a stand-up comic, he would bring his sense of humor to the show. Possibly I should have told him that that was what I wanted, because it turned into a fairly standard interview. Despite his love of comedy, Dr. Burnett's motivation for writing his books is the same as my reason for doing this podcast. We are both trying to combat the oversimplification of neuroscience as it is portrayed in the mainstream media. In fact, he said he likes to avoid talking about dopamine at all because of the tendency to portray it as the source of happiness. The problem with this oversimplification is that it ignores the fact that what dopamine does actually depends on which receptors it hits and what circuits those synapses happen to participate in. His book is worth reading if you're new to neuroscience. He does a great job of explaining the limitations of functional MRI in a way that is humorous rather than boring. He also considers several potential sources of happiness, such as money, fame, sex, and humor. But his overall conclusion is that because we are wired to be social, this appears to be the real key to whether one is happy. Social isolation is bad for both your brain and your happiness. Next, we come to episode 150 with Dr. Seth Grant, who actually first appeared back in episode 51, which originally aired 10 years ago. He was also in episode 101 and 137, so this makes him the first person to appear on the show four times. In this episode, we discussed his group's latest paper, which documents the first ever synaptone, which was a mapping of the synapses of the mouse brain. Grant's lab specializes in the genetic modification of the genes in the mouse that are known to be critical to brain function. They tend to focus on genes that are important in human disease. So for this experiment, they picked two key synapse proteins and genetically programmed them with two fluorescent markers. This allowed them to see where these particular proteins appeared throughout the mouse brain. What they found was incredible diversity, and significantly, the most diverse areas of the brain were those associated with higher cognitive functions. The important take-home point was rather than being the same throughout the brain, it is entirely possible that no two synapses are identical. Dr. Grant considered a few potential implications of this idea, and I highly encourage you to go back and listen if you missed the episode. And don't skip this episode because you think it's too technical. The reason Dr. Grant is one of my favorite guests is because he's really good at making complex ideas clear. I would call him the Richard Feynman of molecular biology, but I fear most of you are too young to appreciate the compliment. The last original episode of the year was episode 151, 
which was a discussion of the neuroscience of emotion, a new synthesis by Dr. Ralph Adoffs and David J. Anderson. One caveat about this episode. I usually try to make every episode standalone friendly, but since emotion is a topic I've been covering since episode 10, I may not have succeeded. The book, The Neuroscience of Emotion, has two goals, to provide an overview of the current science of emotion and to propose a framework for studying emotion across species and disciplines. I focused on the first goal, even though the second was more important, because I think those of you who are working in the field should read the book. There are three key ideas that I want to mention today. One, There is no particular brain region devoted to any specific emotion. The amygdala is not the center of fear. Instead, current research is focusing on how various parts of the brain interact to create emotion. Number two, the book contains an excellent discussion of how the problems of functional MRI are being addressed. This is important because I've been critical of this method in the past. Number three, They argue that animals do have emotions, and the study of animals as well as humans is important because there are tools that can be used in animals that can't be used in humans. So that's it for our 12th Annual Review episode. I hope you will go back and listen to any episodes that you missed. The announcements that I embedded in the show will be included in the episode show notes at brainsciencepodcast.com. If you aren't already subscribed to our free newsletter, I encourage you to do so. That way you will get the show notes automatically each month and you won't miss any shows. Also, please do subscribe to Brain Science in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pandora, Spotify, or wherever you happen to listen. To be honest, we could use some new reviews. And don't forget to share the show with your friends and colleagues. Please check out my other podcasts, books and ideas, and my newest show, Grain Rainbows. Thanks again for listening. I will be back on the fourth Friday in January 2019. Brain Science with Dr. Ginger Campbell is copyright 2018 to Virginia Campbell, MD. You can copy this show to share it with others. But for any other uses or derivatives, please contact me at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com.